it's very important for uh, Thailand and Cambodians uh, because the shared history, shared destiny, is it, it's, it's like this. You know, we have had. Uh, great kingdoms on the same land. So to Cambodians, to the Cambodians, I would imagine, and if there are Cambodians in the room, you may speak up. I mean, this land was their land. The Khmer Empire um, straddled all of this, most of this mainland Southeast Asia on this side. So Northeastern Thailand, Cambodia, all the way to Laos. So if you go, if you go back far enough, it's the Khmer Empire the predecessor, the ancestors of the Cambodians. But then that empire um, declined, and then in place of it were the Siamese empires, Siamese kingdoms, so-called Thai UTR, uh, which eventually declined, uh, and then were rebuilt. So the Thais feel that they've been ripped off, uh, that they, the key date for Thailand, Siamese, is 1893. 1893, when they had to cede uh, a number of territories. Uh, and this continued into the early 1900s. So the Siamese have felt, felt, and the Thais uh, do today, that you know, we made these concessions, territorial concessions, and that the map uh, was a ripoff. The map was incorrect. Yet the Siamese at the time made copies of this map and circulated this map, which became effectively uh, acquiescence seen by the court. Uh, also visited the, the area uh, that was under French uh, governance at the time. And you know, this kind of uh, carried on, it became convoluted, it reached the court, Thailand lost the case. So to the Thai subliminal psyche, they feel that they've been ripped off. The Cambodians also feel that you know, they've been ripped off from a longer time ago. If you want to get a good sense of the Thai uh, sentiment, collective sentiment. In the decision in 1962 to 93, as uh, Jan Vitit mentioned, the three dissenting judges uh, wrote very detailed opinions. And one in particular was uh, an Australian, uh, Sir Percy Spender. And you can look this up, I think, even on Google. He had an eloquent account of why Thailand lost the case. It was not that it didn't have a good claim, valid claim, but that the, the legality of it, the, uh, the lack of the objection to this map uh, was against it. And a uh, very eloquent account, uh, and that's how the Thais feel, and the Khmer's or the Cambodians also have uh, their own view of it. Now, we come to uh, perhaps uh, the historian now, uh, Ajahn Sunet, uh, who shed some light for us on, on why uh, this shared destiny, shared history is so politicized uh, and that why we have such passionate feelings about this, this shared border. Thank you, Ajahn Titenan. Firstly, what I'd like to base is the title of this forum, particularly the word a chair destiny. And this is the, the point that I would like to focus on in my lecture. And secondly, uh, I'm quite happy that uh, Ajahn Bichet tried to at least call attention at the beginning of his talk to history and historiography concerning Thai uh, Cambodian relations. I would like to start my talk from this point. Uh, probably Han temples and all the dispute that we know today have their rooted in 19th and 20th century. Or in other words, when we think about the dispute or problem concerning this particular area, this particular temple, is developed under some sort of political atmosphere, circumstance of either the colonial period or the period after the Second World War. My point is that people at present have very limited knowledge about the historical heritage and the function of this temple and also the mountain it located before the coming of the French in 19th century. 
the value of Pravihan or Pravihan was first evaluated and characterized by the colonial power who you can take a look at the map concerned more about their powers and authority over the land which had to be to have a clear demarcated line or sort of national boundary. After the end of the World War, the value of Pravihan was again evaluated and characterized this time by the government of the centralist political authority, either from Phnom Penh or Bangkok. Undoubtedly, those were under the influence of nationalistic ideology. My point is that we have no perhaps evidence what and we perhaps show no attention to the local people. Uh, the people at the Thai and the Cambodian border what do they think about the temple and the mountain? I think that we, we have very limited knowledge, either what they think about the mountain in the past or what they think about the temple in the future or at present or in the future. Now, I think we are moving to the year 2015 with the year that we expect the blossom of ASEAN spirit and a constructive relation both at the governmental level and also at the people levels and indeed is the, the period that people have become the focal point of ASEAN spirit could perhaps we have a lesson learned from the, our historical heritage regarding the old value of Prabihan Temple. This is possible to explore the profile value of the place before the coming of the West or perhaps before the, the, um, uh, the Second World War period. And to do this, we have got to go a little bit back to the period before the, sorry, before the coming of the French and perhaps a little further during the time of the Angkorian period, I would say. To my understanding, there are about four old inscriptions uh, talking about the all sort of activity concerning at the Prabihan temple. And from the information uh, from those old four Khmer inscriptions, I think we could perhaps learn more about the old value of meaning of the temple before we start to adopt the sort of Western concept of uh, nationalism or uh, territory. To do this, I actually uh, have no uh, uh, knowledge or ability to read the inscription, so I based mainly on two uh, books on history, one of which this book actually is written in English as well. It's about the history of Khao Pabihan, written by a local scholar by the name Tida Salaya. The book was published by the Mương Boran Publications. Uh, this is the Thai version, but there is also an English version. Then that also, the thesis just came out, it's a sort of journal about art and culture. And in this particular journal, there is an, an, a very interesting article written by a local scholar by the name Rung Rod Pilom Anukun, who talk in detail about the, the, what written in those four inscriptions. So my uh, uh, talk will base partially on uh, the, the, the information I got from those books. I would like to start from the fact that people of different origins 
when I'm talking about people of different origins, ethnic groups, families and clans na, uh, living in the area around the mountain that is before the time of the French na, and on both sides of the Dongrak mountain na, establish very close connection na, between themselves and also share the same belief or value about the sacredness of the mountain and the temples. These people could be the charm, the commands, the guy who are master in the art of capturing elephants, the car who are quite active in uh, southern present day the southern Laos kingdom known uh, perhaps during the, the old time Champasa and, and many more people. These people more or less have their connection with this particular temple. Above all, as I previously told you, they share the same belief about the temples, one of which the belief have got to do with spirit worship. When I'm talking about spirit worship, these people in the past, they believe in life after death. So when they believe in life after death, they believe in the spirit of their ingesters and then they worship their ingestor because they expect some sort of protection from you know the, uh, the, 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 uh, the spirit of the ingestor this is some sort of belief that chair among the southeast asianese before the coming of hinduism or buddhism and there is another kind of belief that is animistic, animistic belief which uh, the focus is given to some sort of supernatural power and when they're talking about supernatural power it could be the spirit in the forest, spirit in the rivers like the great serpents in the Mekong rivers or the spirit in the mountain. This actually is totally unknown belief. If you know uh, Sukhothai history and have a chance to read the first inscription of Sukhothai, they talk about a mountain spirit by the name Prakapung. They're talking about the spirit by the name Pakapung, who understood to be like the city spirit, who give protection to Sukhothai people. When come to the case of the Khmer, there is some sort of mountain spirit, because the reason we come to know this is there is a certain kind of cult known as Panom cult. Panom is an old Khmer word mean mountain. It's the mountain cult, which means that in the great or the big mountain, there is a spirit living there inside, and people all sort of like at our level of the societies, the rulers, the commoners, they have got to pay respect to the spirit. And then the authors of those books, one of which believe that there is such a kind of belief associated with the Mount Pravihian and Pravihian temples. So let me show you, this is what it is. You see the great mountain that you could see the location and you could imagine with people in the old time when they think about the mountain, they do oh, this is great mountain, there, there should be some sort of spirit living in and it's their duties to pay homage or to worship the spirit. This is the belief that we believe that existed in this area before the coming of uh, Hinduism and Buddhism. 
and then what happened next nah, the Indian came and then they brought in Hinduism and Buddhism but there is no contradiction between external belief and local belief on the other hand we see a very very uh, peaceful integration between India uh, sense of gods and local sense of animistic belief in India as what you know now they believe in the God in the mountain particularly the white mountain or the Kray Rasa and on top of the Kray Rasa this one they believe that there is this God now Shiva living there so what happened is that the Indian came and the lures in this region they adopt this belief and they try to identify themselves with the Lord Shiva perhaps in order to have some sort of political legitimacy but at the same time there was a sort of old belief rooted in the region before the coming of Hinduism so at this point we see some sort of combination between Indian belief and local belief at the end of the day we have the tradition uh, carried by several Khmer kings in the old time the tradition of building temples on top of the mountain and turn out to be mountain temples if there is no mountain they built temple in the form of mountain such as Angkor Wat okay so in this respect you see some sort of combination and then what happened the king in lower Khmer or in the, the Cambodian Empire they have got to have a sort of connection with the people living in the area at the present-day Thai Cambodian border and beyond so they have got to make friends with local people sometimes they have got to try to control them sometimes they have got to try to share the belief they have so they brought in the concept of God King you see the Lord Shiva identify himself as the Lord Shiva and then build temple on top of the Pravihian mountain so people when they think about that they could think about this in many respects they could think in the form of local belief they could perhaps uh, integrate local belief with Indian belief but more or less what we at the end of the day have is that every people you see the commoners people on both sides the Khmer kings they are doing the same thing which turn out to be some sort of chair uh, sort of ritual that is the ritual of worshipping the mountain and the god on the mountain okay for this you can uh, take a look okay this is what I'm trying to show you for example this is the way in which the Khmer people in the past thought about the great mountain and who live on top of the great mountain the Kailasa and this is the, the Bali leaf I got from uh, one of the most beautiful temple in Khmer is the um, um, I forgot the name uh, um, uh, Bantai Shri Bantai Shri temples and the person sitting on top of that is the god who sit on top of the Kairasa mountain the Lord Vishnu who is punishing Ravana who tried to challenge his power this is the idea this is the world of the, the, the people in the old time and when they think about the, the, the mountain when they think about uh, what uh, they should do it has got to do with this sort of belief okay the same thing this could be seen in the case of Phnom Rung they built 
the temple from Lord for Lord Shiva on top of the mountain in the same manner as what they did to Khao Prabihan or Prabihian temples. This is said. You will see clearly that at the well, creek, uh, the, the, the central part or the main sanctuary of the temple situated and to see some sort of walkway that lead it to the, 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 the southern side. Here we go. And this another angle. And we come to know that from the past to the present. First, we know that before the Khmer start to move into this area, the Khmer here, I do mean the king at Angkor, start to extend his uh, powers directly or indirectly na, into this area. There were peoples, many clan, many families living in the area that uh, Khao Pavihan situated. So when the Khmer King start to move into this area, we have evidence that this might probably start from the very beginning of the, uh, the, the time that the Angkorian Kingdom established, that is about early 9th century. So we have from the inscriptions that the king who play very decisive role in this area are, for example, Jayakraman II, Suryakraman I, and this one who has done a lot in terms of building temples, many things on the temple, Suryakraman II. Now this, and, uh, and before that period, there is another one known by the name Yasso Varaman. This king identified himself as a god or Hindu god or as Vishnu, but at the same time, they worship the mountain and try to carry on the, the tradition of uh, the, the Panom cult, which I previously mentioned. So, at the end of the day, what you have is that Pavihan na, turned out to be one of the greatest pilgrimage sites that combine people of the highland mean that allow Korat tours and also the people in the lowland or lower Cambodia that is from the Palaisa. You see, uh, these people according to the inscription led by the king of the Cambodian. Now, uh, they came to the mountains and tried to uh, support in many respects uh, the Brahman living in the mountains, uh, the all sort of uh, uh, needs that the people or the priests in the mountain uh, expect to have. So this is very interesting that Pavihan in the old time, at least before the coming of the West, is neither a property of a particular group of people. It's not actually a property of a particular kingdoms or kings, but it is indeed a public property. It's a property that people from, you know, uh, the, the area that they share the same belief, nah, uh, you know, come together and uh, doing the same thing and uh, showing respect to the temples. I think that this is the spiritual, uh, spiritual focal point of the temple that's originated there long before the period that we start to adopt and adapt Western ideology. 
even though it, there is no evidence that after the time of Suya Warman II, Khmer King uh, support, uh, you know, the, 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 um, the, the Prabihan temples in, uh, as what the, the interested did. But we know that, that the people around that area still now pilgrim to these temples and try at least now uh, to do something that well that thing that would bring uh, luck would bring prosperity back to their uh, place back to their village back to their town uh, i think when come to this point what is quite interesting is that people in the old time when they think about Pravihir temple here they think more in terms of public property they think more in terms of sharing I think the term sharing is very important but we have forgot we have forgotten for some reason. This is the real and the old function of many, uh, in addition to this temple, all the temples as well, is the public place that people, the ruling class, the commoners could come and perhaps live together. People of different origins, different background could share the, their belief. So, I think that to what extent what could we do about Pravihan at present? You see, if we consider Pravihan as world heritage, yes, legally, I have no objection that it could perhaps belong to the Kingdom of Cambodia and, 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 and we should ask what Ajahn Wichit said that show respect to the judgment of the, the, uh, the court. But I, I think we have got to think about this temple at the local level as well. Now, at the level of ordinary peoples. You know what happened? Even though we have this peel, we have conflict and we have sort of judgment, but when time passed by, there were quite a number of tourists now, from Cambodia, from Thailand, and from the, um, you know, the foreign countries came to Khao Pavihan. That is before Khao Pavihan was granted as world heritage. Very interesting. After that, no more, no more visit. No more business. It's quite contradict to the, the, the spirit of world heritage. You see, and I and I think that to me, I don't care whether the Kaupavihan or the temples belong to the Cambodian kingdoms or to the Thai kingdom. But what I care more is that it should belong to the people now in this region that belong to the local people, the local people in these regions, and the people outside the region that would like to show the appreciate to this temple as the symbol or temple of the world. And, and I think it is possible that at the end, now, at least we should have this perception and understanding when we try to talk who supposed to rule Khao Pavihan, who supposed to have the legal light over Khao Pavihan, at least have part of the brain to think about the, the, the people, think about this place as world heritage. Now, I think 
this is quite important. Otherwise, it's, it has no meaning to say that it's the world heritage and no one can can come to this place. No one want to come to it. It's the, the dangerous zone or something like that. It's quite contradict to the spirit of world heritage. So, at this point, would it possible that we could think more about the old historical heritage, value and function that it used to be in the past and try to connect it with the present situation in the context of world heritage. Thank you. Thank you, Ajahn Sunet. <clears throat> you know, of the many legacies from history, and uh, F Professor Sunet's uh, account reminds us of the shared history and shared destiny. Uh, people in Thailand, in Sisaket province, Surin province, they speak Cambodian. We have a famous and infamous politician named Ne Win. He speaks Cambodian. So in fact, uh, the legacy is a very strong uh, pre-colonial uh, times. There were really a one people and one land. Now, we haven't talked about domestic politics. I want to come to my colleague, uh, Professor uh, Jan Pong Tong. Uh, so she, she will address the more contemporary uh, events. And we haven't addressed uh, certain issues. Uh, for example, how did this case reappear in court on 28 April 2011? And the, the politics of it, uh, the PAD, the, the listing of the World Heritage Site uh, by Cambodia in, uh, in 2008 that led to political convulsions, turmoil in Thailand, and it ended up uh, derailing a, a, the government of Samak and Samshai. Uh, a lot to be said, domestic politics on this side and also on the other side. Uh, one reason I think that when the verdict comes out, it will not be as severe or adverse as perhaps a year or two ago, because the two governments get along better. So I don't imagine that Prime Minister Hun Sen will make it worse for Thailand if the decision is against Thailand. At the same time, Hun Sen cannot do too much because he also has domestic constituencies to, to accommodate in Cambodia. Uh, but if we had another government, if we had a democratic government, and this decision comes out, I could imagine that Prime Minister Hun Sen would make it worse for Thailand. Uh, so the conditions are more conducive for a win-win. <coughs> uh, so let me go straight to uh, Chan Pong Tong uh, on the uh, domestic politics of, of this uh, we hear probably hand, and uh, Jan Pung Tong has done a research project, uh, written a book in Thai on the uh, probably hand uh, controversy and tension. Jan, Jan Kap, Jan Kap. Uh, your, ex your Excellency is an uh, distinguished participant. The issue I would like to talk here is related to the title of this forum, the uh, Chair Destiny. But I would like to talk about the two Chair Destinies Thailand and Cambodia have in regard uh, to the temple. See, uh, the first destiny was the one that had been agreed by the government of the two countries before the temple became the conflict in the mid-2008. This destiny has been ruined. But there are possibility that it might come back. And the second destiny that I would like to talk is about uh, what uh, Thailand and Cambodia may face uh, from now on. So the first one is about the, uh, uh, is will related to the origin and development uh, of the temple cooperation between the two countries. Why uh, before 2008, Thailand and Cambodia uh, agree that both countries will uh, support, uh, will promote the temple previously here uh, as a world heritage size. We have to look uh, at this. Uh, uh, agreement, this cooperation in the old picture of the regional cooperations uh, at the end of the Cold War. I see, uh, you, all know, you all know that in 2008, uh, Thailand, during the government of um, Sabak Sun Tarawe, signed a joint communique. Um, this joint communique signed by the former uh, foreign ministers, Nathodong Patama 
and uh, Cambodian counterpart Hon Nam Hong. Thailand agreed to uh, support Cambodia in uh, nominating the temple as a world heritage site, but this joint communique has been attacked by the, the PAD or the People Alliance for Democracy or the Yellow Church Movement as a kind of uh, attrition that trying that Thaksin and his uh, proxy trying to sell uh, Thai territory in exchange for Thaksin's business interests. But I want to look back, take you back to look at why uh, Thai government agreed to promote uh, the temple of privy here as a world heritage. And, uh, this cooperation came at the end of the Cold War when the conflict in Indochina ended. So uh, the three Indochinese countries, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, became uh, uh, friends or uh, a partner uh, to uh, other ASEAN uh, countries, including Thailand. So it's an opportunity. The end of the Cold War provided Thailand with opportunity to expand economic empire to the neighboring countries. Thailand at the time dream of becoming a center of, of uh, financial. Uh, uh, business uh, transportation center of the region, uh, of being a tourism center of the region. Thailand want to be a regional leader at the time. So tourism is part of regional economy integration policy promoted by Thailand as well as uh, the GMS proje projects, the Greater Mekong Subregion Project and ACMEX. And it was a uh, supported by the ADB, the Asian Development Bank. So the opening of the uh, Previhir Temple for tourist visit was actually initiated by the Thai government, which was uh, urged by the business sector in the northeastern part of Thailand. That I mean, This happened in during the government of Chai Chunhoban in 1990 because it's the opportunity that the northeastern part of Thailand, which used to be some kind of a uh, cross region and the poorest region in Thailand, uh, can expand its tourism uh, across the border. So the Privihir Temple was integrated into part of Thailand's cross-border tourism since Chati Chai Chunoban government. Then uh, it had developed, uh, both countries uh, cooperated, and then in mid-2003, a concrete plan has been uh, uh, created. The country plan to prominate the temple on the World Heritage List. It began in mid-2003. Uh, it's at the beginning of Thaksin Shinawat. Uh, so Thailand Cambodia government established a joint committee for the Previhir Temple development. And then a year later, this committee reached five major principles. The first one, the temple project would be a symbol of friendship between Thailand and Cambodia based on mutual interest. The second point, the temple would become a world heritage for humanity. This is beautiful, isn't it? The third point, Thailand and Cambodia would work together to solve our major problems related to the temple, such as disordered shop houses, demining the area, and also the environmental problem. The third point that has been uh, reached, the temple project will be developed in line with regional cooperation frameworks, including the GMS and ACMEX. And the fifth point, the temple project will not affect the border demarcation between the two countries. This cooperation, eventually, uh, uh, the, the point that Thailand and Cambodia will jointly develop the 4.6 square kilometers of the disputed area was actually included in the joint communique signed by Nopodon Pachama in mid-2008. But this plan has been ruined.
in my opinion, this kind of cooperation is a shared destiny that uh, the government uh, of Thailand and Cambodia, actually not just Thaksin, when we look at the, the whole period of this cooperation, it started from uh, the government of Thai Chai Chunawan, and then uh, continue, it become a concrete plan during the Thaksin Chunawan. And also, it also uh, include the government of uh, General Surayuturanon, which came after the coup d'etat which overthrow uh, Thaksin Chinawad uh, government. The government of Surayut did not object the nomination of the temple as a warrior church at all. But the only thing that they object is the map attached, that can be attached to the nomination file. Because of that map included the disputed area in, into it. But later on, Cambodia agreed to exclude that disputed area from its nomination file. And it was clear in, in this, this map has been shown on the website of the, the Cambodian government, but it did not include the disputed area into the, uh, into the uh, World Heritage uh, uh, inscription at all. But still, it was uh, uh, the, the Yellow Shirt movement just dismissed this point. It still insisted that the, it, uh, Cambodia included this disputed area into uh, the World Heritage uh, inscription. Mm -hmm. So, in my opinion, this collaboration is a is a great effort to overcome uh, to solve the territorial dispute by uh, economics and cultural method. By economic means, both sides sharing the interest, the economic interest, business uh, in both Thailand, and, uh, especially the tour, uh, tourism business in both Thailand and Cambodia, can enjoy this uh, growing interest. But this kind of great effort, which in my opinion is a, is a uh, the first of its kind in Southeast Asia, that the two government, the former antagonistic government, try to solve it by using economic and cultural methods. But this effort it has been ruined. So uh, we are now facing uh, another shared destiny. Uh, mm -hmm. The destiny Thailand and Cambodia may, uh, may face is may face from now on in regard to the temple issue. It depends on the world court verdict as well as the political situation in Thailand. Though you, we all know that since uh, Prime Minister Ying Lang assumed office over a year ago, her government successfully restored Thailand relationship with Cambodia. The overall relationship is better improved. So the dispute over the overlapping crab area has been sent back to the court. And, um, and, and many of us may wish that the final verdict would help solve the conflict. Still, so I'm not quite sure about that. I think there is still a bumpy road ahead of the relationship. We cannot definitely rule out another big border crash yet. As we all know that several border crashes in the temple has been listed uh, as a border site. Mm. There's uh, uh, several crashes, and they, this crash forced Cambodia government to request the court to interpret the 1962 verdict. In my opinion, there are two possible outcomes of the verdict. The, that you, you, you uh, that Jatina has said before. For the first possible outcome. In my opinion, the court may decide that the frontier line of the disputed area is the line drawn on the 1908 map or the Annex 1 map that uh, Cambodia claimed her sovereignty over the temple and also claimed sovereignty over the disputed area adjacent to the temple. If this is the outcome, it means Thailand will lose the 4.6 square kilometer near the temple. It will certainly cause an uproar and crisis in Thailand. For the second possible verdict, the court may say that it has no jurisdiction over the case since it had decided in 1962 that it would not make a verdict about the frontier line. Mm -hmm. Then we, uh, we did, uh, highly explain, clearly explain this uh, issue to you, lady. If this is the outcome, it means that nobody wins but nobody lose either. The area remain an overlapping crepe area. So it 
get back to the status quo. The question is, what would be a reaction from Thailand regarding these two possible outcomes? Cambodia leader Somdet Hun Sen has said clearly that it would comply with the ICJ verdict. Whatever it would be, Cambodia would comply. But in Thailand, we have not heard such thing from the government yet. Why is that so? I think the Ying Lak government is so worried that the temple issue will be again exploited by the anti taxing movement to overthrow uh, the government. Early this year, I think around January, the government appeared to try to prepare the public about the possible verdict the court may make. It's clear that they want to prevent a crisis if Thailand loses the case. So it, the government wanted the public to accept the court verdict, whatever it will be. So the f foreign minister, Suropong, started by telling the public about the two possible outcomes. That means Thailand may either lose the disputed area or the area return to the status quo of disputed area. Unfortunately, Minister Surupong was not a credible speaker. He is always perceived by the anti-taxi movement as only a puppet of taxi, and he is not a good speaker either. So it got fierce attacks by the yellow shirt, the nationalist group, and the mainstream media. They attack the government as too weak and too early and too ready to give in to Cambodia for the sake of taxing interests. That uh, they said that the government did not, did not try hard enough to fight for Thai territory, to protect Thai territory, to ter territory and too ready to lose. So Suropong retreated so quickly and clearly say that, well, the government would do it best to fight the court and protect Thai territory. On the contrary, while the government now is uh, do nothing to prepare the public about a possible outcome, the nationalists, nationalists have continued spreading misinformation about the temple issues via its uh, media outlets, such as the uh, miniature media groups, the social media, and some uh, mainstream media also play along. The misinformation they spread is this. Uh, if Thailand lose the 4.6 square kilometers, we will also lose the 1.6 million square, uh, no, 1.6 million right uh, in the northeastern part of Thailand, which is, which is equivalent to 240,000 hectares. So it means about one-fourth of the northeastern uh, part of Thailand will go to Cambodia. And it's, uh, the nationalists also claim that we will lose the maritime area to Cambodia as well. This maritime area contains vast appreciated oil and gas reserve. I mean, this kind of misinformation based on no evidence at all. But a lot of people believe in it. We can see the, the followers of this website or social media, they were all angry about uh, the possible loss that Thailand may, may have. And some academics told the media that if Thailand lost the court battle, Thai government did not have to comply with the ICJ order. Mm. Besides, the PAD leaders made their wishful thinking so clearly and loudly that the temple issue will be an effective instrument for them to overthrow the Yingluck government. So it is clear that the PAD and its allies are waiting for the moment to attack to overthrow the government again. But the question is how efficient and effective the nationalists would be this time. Can they mobilize mass for heart as much as they did in the early stage of the temple conflict? I tend to believe that though the loss will definitely cause resentment to t among Thai people in general, but the PAD will not be so successful as earlier because its leaders were tainted with so many financial scandals and incredibility and uh, in fire conflict. However, whether PAD will succeed or not, it will depend on reactions 
by other key players in Thai politics. That is whether how many helping hands it will receive from the groups of anti-Saxins uh, movements such as the, uh, the senators or even from the judicial uh, uh, organization such as the constitution and administrative courts. And most importantly, um, the factor that may contribute to the success or failure of the PAD is the reaction from the military how the military will react to the nationalist call that we have to see. In my opinion, the military will face a dilemma because of their dual uh, conflicting duties. On the one hand, they must behave as provisional military. They have to follow the government's order. On the other hand, they have a duty to protect national uh, territory and sovereignty. For the first duty as a provisional military, if the government insists that Thailand will have to comply to the court order, even though we lose, the military leaders will say they are professional, so they have to follow the government order. Mm. So don't blame them. Which quite, for me, it is quite, a, uh, quite good. I think they, if, if we actually lose, I mean, then I, I hope that they will stick to this uh, duty as professional military. And also, this position also protect them from any li liability. But the government must be forceful and assertive on this position. Unfortunately, I don't see such quality from the government at all. In fact, I don't think the military want to enter war with Cambodia. The war will be too costly for both sides and we already have so much problem in the 3,000 more provinces. So we don't want to open another, I don't think the military want to open another better front. <laughs> Besides, I think the military can say that though Thailand is a bigger country, there is no guarantee that Thailand will win. Since Cambodia is not a weak state as it was 20 years ago. If you remember, about 20 years ago, we have a uh, border war with uh, Laos. At the time, Laos was just emerged from uh, uh, the, the war, and then they were very poor. But we couldn't win that war. Mm. And besides, we can imagine that the international community will not stand still, letting the bigger country refuse the right of the small country. ASEAN and the UN uh, Security Council will be brought by Cambodia. We will be brought in by Cambodia and Thailand will be pressure from the national community to abide to the court order. As of now, as I uh, had talked to some military officers, their position is to do as the government tell them to do. However, the duty of protecting national territory and sovereignty of which the Thai military always claim to be the most sacred to them. We make them a target of the nationalists. If the military believe that, if the military uh, leaders say they simply follow the government order, they will be, uh, certainly will be harassed and insulted by the nationalists as being coward, being traitor. Mm -hmm. So if the military leaders cannot stand this harassment, and if there is other pressure behind the scene, which we don't know what gonna happen, there's so many factors, many uh, behind the scene prayers in Thai politics, as you all know. The military may fail of life to perform this so-called sacred duty, and then a border crash is possible. But this is the worst case scenario for uh, a so-called shared destiny of Thailand and Cambodia. There is still a better case scenario with uh, which I will present. If the court say it has no jurisdiction over the case, it will not make a verdict about the frontier line, as it said in the 1962 uh, verdict. So the disputed area remain a dispute. Then the best solution to this uh, conflict is for us to push for a joint development 
of the disputed area and turn it into an international peace park. Turn it back to its former destiny that Thailand and Cambodia had agreed up on before, before the conflict flared up in 2008. In the last four years, I, mean, I have proposed this idea at various forums and articles, but the PAD so despised it. It said that the 4.6 square kilometer must belong to Thailand only. The Thai government must not negotiate with Cambodia. Therefore, if this scenario took place, the court declined to make a verdict about the frontier line. So I think it's our duty, whether you are from civil society, academics, from uh, the army, international organizations, the media, we should support this idea, a joint development of the disputed area, do it persistently and loudly. And I hope that this will be a shared destiny we will see uh, uh, for Thailand and Cambodia. Thank you.